In today's video, we're gonna talk about what metabolic adaptation is and why it makes it harder for you to lose weight and keep it off. We're gonna go through six bits. So we'll talk about just a primer and energy balance. Then we're gonna talk about hormones. Then I'm gonna go through an overfeeding study, an underfeeding study. We'll talk about the semi-starvation study in Minnesota. And finally, about the biggest loser and how they failed to keep the weight off. Should be a really interesting one. Let's get into it. Okay, to kick off today's video, we're gonna talk about energy balance, and this should be really short. It's just so that you understand the kind of three basic states of energy balance and what they mean for gaining weight. So basically, you can be either eating more food than you need, about as much food as you need, or less food than you need. And what we call these are a surplus, when you're eating more food than you need and you're gaining weight, maintenance, when you're eating about what you need and you're maintaining your weight, or the deficit, which is eating less calories than you need and hence losing weight. And these are the three states of energy balance. But often people totally oversimplify this idea of kind of calories in, calories out. And they'll say something silly like, well, all you need is a 500 calorie deficit and you'll lose a pound a week indefinitely and everything will be roses. And obviously we know that's not true because you know, if I have a maintenance of 3000 calories, and I drop to five, drop 500 calories to 2,500 calories a day, we know that I'm not gonna indefinitely lose a pound a week. We know things are gonna change. We know that our body is gonna adapt to that situation by making me hungry and using less energy. And those adaptations are what we're gonna talk about today, which is why we need to modify this idea of energy balance to think more completely by including the role of hormones. Okay, now let's talk about hormones. So over the course of a year, the average American eats something like a million calories. And yet the average American ends up within a few pounds of what they were the previous year. What this leads you to believe is that the, the body is very good at matching its energy intake with its energy needs. And it's true, the body is very, very good at that. In particular, the brain has the ability to increase hunger or downgrade energy expenditure. And it does that based on hormonal feedbacks that it gets from the body. So I think the primary way to think about this was in 1994, they discovered, um, they discovered leptin, which is a hormone that's secreted from your fat, acts on the hypothalamus in the brain, and it has a large role in when you're losing weight, it will upgrade your hunger and downgrade your energy expenditure. And this is the correct way to think about energy balance. Yes. Body weight is largely determined by energy in and energy out, but those two are not independent. Those two are linked intrinsically by this feedback loop from hormones to the brain, which then regulates hunger and regulates energy expenditure. And you know, the, this hypothalamus, the bit in the brain, they sometimes call this the lipostat um, in, in the research, which basically means that bit of your brain is regulating your, your fat mass to a large degree and when things go awry with your fat mass or you gain way too much weight, it's because there's something going wrong in your hypothalamus. So this is the more kind of nuanced version of energy balance and it is incredibly complex. So it's not just leptin, it's also things like uh, insulin, it's, it's um, PKY, it's ghrelin, it's all these things. There are so many hormones going on and, and they're really, really complex. But the important thing just at this level is we want to know that your body is going to adapt because your body, when it starts to lose weight, will send hormonal signals to your brain and your brain will start to adjust so that essentially your body doesn't starve. Your body is trying to maintain a level of fat that will keep it at reproductive status and allow you to pass on your DNA. And those are you know, defense mechanisms that we have developed over millions of years. Okay, now first up, I'm gonna talk about a study where we deal with the adaptation to overfeeding because it's important to realize that this, this mechanism where your body adjusts to how much food you're eating, it cuts in both directions and it is the reason why a lot of us have not careered off to thousands of pounds in weight because as we eat more, we burn more. So I wanna talk about the adaption to overfeeding first just so that this isn't purely the idea that your body hates you and it's against you. No, no, it works in both ways. It's just that the downward adaptation is probably a little bit stronger. So we have a study, um, what they did was they overfed people by a thousand calories for eight weeks. And what this resulted in after the eight weeks, they gained an average of 4.7 kilos 
or about 10 pounds. It's important to state whenever there's an overfeeding study, the variation is always very large. So genetically, when you overfeed people, some people will burn off a very large percentage of that energy and gain very little fat, whereas other people will gain the majority of it. So the adaptation to overfeeding is very genetic. Some people, ectomorph types, they will just burn off that energy and not gain much weight. So it's incredible, right, if you've got that adaptation. What they found was that the total daily energy expenditure in response to 10 weeks of overfeeding by 1,000 calories a day increased on an average of 551 calories. So this is why you can't simply say, you know, 1,000 calories a day for eight weeks, they should have gained 30 pounds or whatever. No, they only gained 10 pounds because the body burnt more energy because of what I've said, that these two are interlinked. So when you overfeed the body, it's going to start using more energy. It's a very clever adaptation. And more importantly, the adaptation, and this is going to be constantly the case, when there is a metabolic adaptation, the primary area in which the body adjusts is its need. It's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So basically, people move a bit more, they fidget a bit more, their post control changes, maybe, you know, these things are how the, the area of the body that is most reactive to changes in diet. And we're going to see this as the study progresses. So that's it. Basically, overfeed people, they gain weight, but they also increase their energy expenditure dramatically, and most of the increase comes from NEAT. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about how the body adapts to a period of underfeeding. So there's a classic study where they put everyone kind of on a 25% deficit via either just diet or diet and exercise, and they measured their bodies to see how they would adapt to this. And what I've done is I've taken the data from the people who just put on a 25% deficit. So basically, on average, they needed 2,800 calories, and then they dropped that to around 2,100 calories. So a 700 calorie deficit for three months, what happened? They lost an average of six kilos or 13 pounds. So it was effective for weight loss. They were put on a classic 25% deficit and they lost 13 pounds in about three months. So just a little over or bang on a pound a week. What they found was that the total daily energy expenditure dropped by 454 calories. So that is, to begin with, they had a deficit of 700 calories, which is, you know, the pound and a half a week deficit and it's dropped down to just 250 calories, so half a pound a week, because the adaptation was a full 454 calories. So the body is sensing, like I said, the brain is sensing that it's losing weight, and what it does is it downgrades energy expenditure. A little bit of it comes in a loss purely because you're weighing less, so when you move more, that's kind of the normal expected um, loss in total daily energy expenditure, but then on top of that, we have this adaptive thermogenesis, the metabolic adaptation, where basically the brain saying, I'm losing this weight, I need to defend my fat mass, and it is gonna make itself more efficient, and it is gonna downregulate its energy expenditure. And once again, we see that most of the adaptation came in terms of NEAT, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, so basically people are moving less, they're fidgeting less, their posture control changes, they become more sluggish, or they just become more efficient in all their movements, and the body is thus defending itself from losing further fat. And oh, what, what we haven't shown there is obviously there's also an upgrade in hunger. As people lose weight, they get hungrier. So it's working on those two levels. As the body loses weight, it's trying to defend its fat mass by downgrading energy expenditure and upregulating hunger, which is why it is very, very hard to stick with diets, and we always see this kind of exponential decay of adherence between six months and 12 months, because actually the body is defending itself hormonally from that weight loss. And it's very, very clever starvation response, which, you know, makes a lot of sense in terms of our evolution, but it makes it hard to lose weight. So it's really important to understand your body is actually fighting fat loss actively by adapting. Okay, next up, we're gonna talk about the Minnesota semi-starvation study, which is pretty much the most fascinating study in the history of nutrition. What they did was they took a bunch of healthy men who were conscientious objectors in the war, who wanted to help out their country but didn't wanna fight, and they put them into this kind of controlled study to assess what the effects would be of semi-starvation like you might find in wartime Europe where food was really rationed. And it's a fascinating study, and it's the study that people generally cite to, the, to, to kind of prove the idea that 
Metabolic damage per se, this idea of permanent metabolic damage doesn't really exist because although your metabolism will crash, it will recover. And I'm going to explain the study now. At the start of the study, the men were maintaining their body weight at around 3,600 calories. Then for 24 weeks, they dropped their calories all the way down to 1,600 calories. Then was it, there was a controlled refeeding period of about three months. And then finally, they just let them eat ad limitum so they could regain their weight. In response to this drastic energy restriction, their energy expenditure crashed almost 50% to below 2,000 calories. Then in the overfeeding period, their metabolism gradually recovered to the point where their total daily energy expenditure was actually up where it began in the first place. If we put the energy expenditure and intake lines together, we can see how the semi-starvation drove significant fat loss during the enormous deficit of the semi-starvation period. And then during the overfeeding period, the surplus created the additional fat mass where they recovered their metabolic rate. Okay, now I just wanna warn you, these examples of metabolic adaptation are by far the largest that you can find anywhere in the literature. So these are very, very extreme, and it's extremely unlikely that you would be able to do this to yourself because it's simply too hard. So what they found was that the total daily energy expenditure crashed by like 1,800 calories during the semi-starvation period, and then it recovered a full 1,900 calories during the refeeding and overfeeding periods. And what people kind of take from this study is the idea that within lean subjects, there is no permanent metabolic damage. Basically, when your body um, loses fat mass, it's gonna downgrade your energy expenditure, and when it recovers fat mass, it will upgrade your energy expenditure. And basically, people took away from this that, you know, there is no permanent metabolic damage. Okay, now last up, we're gonna talk about the biggest loser study, which I think is probably the saddest study I've ever read in terms of nutrition. And this was a study of participants in one of the seasons of The Biggest Loser. They looked at them at the start of the competition and then at the end of the competition, which I think was 30 weeks, so 30 weeks later. And then they did a follow-up study six years later and these were the results. So at the start of the competition, the average weight of the contestants was about 149 kilos. So uh, what is that? That's 330 pounds, roughly. Um, and uh, the, by the end of the competition, it was about 91 kilos, so that's 190 pounds. And then six years later, they had rebounded up to 132 kilos. So from 149 down all the way to like 91 kilos, a pretty normal weight, and then they've rebounded, they've regained fully 40, 41 pounds. So they've regained... 90, 90 and a bit pounds in the in the the six years after the um after the show finished. Now, what they found was they looked they luckily they'd um, not luckily but by design they had measured the important variables. So what they found was that the total daily energy expenditure this it started at three thousand eight hundred calories, which is high but to be expected because these people were very large. Then at the end of the study, their total daily energy expenditure was down to 3,002 calories. So they'd lost about 800 calories in expenditure. And then six years later, when they regained the weight, it was back up to 3,429 calories. Now those aren't, those, those aren't particularly weird. The total daily energy expenditure from 3,800 down to 3,000, back up to 3,400. Most of that can be explained by their weight. But the really interesting finding was what happened to their resting metabolic rate. And this is the very sad thing. So their resting metabolic rate began at 2,607, dropped down to 1,996. And then after they'd regained the weight six years later, their resting metabolic rate was still down at 1,903 calories. So basically, when they lost all this weight, their resting metabolic rate crashed down by about 600, 600 calories and it never recovered when they regained this weight. And the conclusion was that persistent metabolic adaptation to weight loss exists. And this is this, you know, this study was really an indictment of the biggest loser. It just kind of showed that the methods that they use in that program, um, you know, they don't result in permanent weight loss because obviously these adaptations are at play, but also, you know, the methods that they use with the extreme exercise, with the very low calorie diet potentially not enough protein, not enough weight training, it puts into question the methods that they use and how effective that drastic form of weight loss is for bigger people trying to lose weight 
and keep it off. And obviously, you know, some weight regain is always the case. When people lose weight, it's quite natural for there to be weight gain because of, you know, the brain fighting for that weight gain. But this case where people's resting metabolism dropped down significantly and stayed right down there despite regaining um, all that weight, you know, it's a pretty sad case. So what am I trying to say here? Now, I'll just try and wrap up. The idea that you're, you have one fixed maintenance, that your metabolism is just some fixed number of total daily energy expenditure is total nonsense. Obviously, I've shown that your metabolism adapts. So for instance, if my maintenance is 2,800 calories and I go on a big old bulk of overeating and lifting and overeating and lifting, I could easily push my maintenance up to 3,300 calories. On the other hand, if I starve myself down and lose a whole bunch of weight, my maintenance could drop maybe down to 2,300, who knows? But the important thing to note is that this, the energy in and energy out, they are interlinked. They, it is very complex, the whole kind of calories in, calories out, it's all just about a 500 calorie deficit. You know, This is way, way too simplistic. Your body is an incredibly dynamic system and your brain's job is to defend its fat mass from the ravages of um, dieting, which it interprets as starvation. So. On some positive notes, what can we do when we're losing weight, when you're creating some type of deficit, regardless of what you're using, if it's intermittent fasting, if it's paleo, if it's keto, if, it's, if it fits in macros, regardless of what you're doing, you have an interest in trying to protect your metabolism, whether that is by lifting more, eating sufficient protein, taking enough steps, cycling your calories, you know, some people would argue for fasting. Someone might say it's a ketogenic diet, whatever. This idea of doing something you can to protect your metabolism, this is a very, very good idea. I would warn you against doing, do not go very low calorie with lots of cardio because essentially you're just sending kind of three real signals to your brain to defect it, protect its fat mass rigorously, which is if you've got very low energy availability from your food, which is very low calories, high amount of cardio, which is really, really pushing your energy expenditure, and then declining fat mass, so you're losing fat. Those three things, you know, you're just sending signals to your brain to downgrade your energy expenditure. And you know, that energy expenditure is energy expenditure you need in the long run to try and keep your metabolic rate ticking over because protecting your metabolism is a massive part of losing weight and keeping it off in the long run. I hope you enjoyed that. That is a very, very geeky video. But, you know, if you liked it, please subscribe and, uh, you know, chuck a comment below and ask me if you've had any experience with that because, um, you know, it's really fascinating. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you jump on the email list and get our five simple strategies to start losing weight cheat sheet.